Good afternoon and welcome to United TV. My name is Kamal Arkan. Today is April 19, 2024. Today, we have a distinct honor of hosting Governor John Carney, the esteemed leader of our great state of Delaware. Governor Carney has been at the forefront of uh, guiding Delaware through both terms and challenges, always with a steadfast commitment at, uh, to the well-being and prosperity of our citizens. Throughout his tenure, uh, Governor Carney championed initiatives aimed at driving economic growth, fostering innovations, and ensuring that Delaware remains a place where all residents have the opportunity to thrive. Today, we have a privilege of delving deeper into the issues that matters most for Delawareans. We will explore Governor's uh, vision for the state, discuss key property, uh, priorities outlined in the state of state address, and gain valuable insight into the strategies being implemented. But today's discussion is uh, more than just the policies and initiatives. It's more about the conversation, engagement, and dialogue. So today is about coming together as the community to listen, learn, collaborate, and share a uh, pursuit of better future for Delaware. So without further ado, uh, I'm thrilled to welcome Governor John Carney to United TV. John, how are you doing? Oh, great. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Look forward to talking to you about some of our priorities uh, for state government. Um, in uh, the last year of my term as governor, it's been in quite a ride for the last uh, seven plus years. You know, we had the pandemic. I know so many of the folks that uh, that do the work that, that you're involved with are part of that. And we want to thank them uh, for their work during a very difficult time, an unprecedented time in the history of our state and our country. We really looked to healthcare workers to step up to the plate, and they did an incredible job. Everybody did, really, uh, when you think about it. Uh, every time I have the opportunity to thank our Delaware Army and Air National Guard, I do so. had that opportunity yesterday. Whenever we needed them, whether it was to do testing or vaccination sites, even at the end, uh, they volunteered to get trained as, uh, as CNAs and work in long-term care facilities. So it was a very... Very difficult time, and uh, we came out of it, like many states, very strong economically, and and those are our priorities of ours, and uh, we focused on uh, building a strong and growing economy, and that's the core of what, what uh, I'm trying to do as I leave office. So I guess uh, coming up with the budget and uh, trying to get everything in order, uh, that's a very stressful, uh, challenging uh, time for not just for the state, but for any of the other businesses. So from the 2024 to 2025, what are the what are some highlights of the uh, transition? Yeah, I think there are really three pretty big spending priorities. One is like every employer in our state, we've got this very difficult labor market where we have more jobs than people looking for work. And it's driven wages up. And at the state government, we have lots of vacancies and we've had to raise uh, salaries, teacher salaries, other public employee salaries to compete with the private sector. Uh, and so that's a there's a big cost associated with that. We're trying to raise our beginning salary for teachers to $60,000 a year on par with what they're doing in the state of Maryland. We need to, when those young people graduate from University of Delaware and Delaware State University, we need them to stay here in Delaware to teach in our public schools and and uh, and so there are lots of things that we've done there in the budget. Uh, the second thing that's driving spending in our budget is health care, both health care for state employees and re retirees. And we cover probably over 100,000 uh, people in Delaware. And then you have uh, those who are Medicaid recipients uh, and that those costs, even though it's like 50 percent paid for by the federal government, 50 percent by the state. So overall, the healthcare budget of the state is over $2 billion of a $6 billion uh, budget. And then, so that's a priority as well. And then lastly, and I, and I mentioned this briefly, uh, and these aren't our only priorities, is uh, funding to help uh, improve the performance in our schools. You know, one of the things that we know, particularly in this tight labor market, is that we have to have 
a workforce that's prepared for the jobs that are available and uh, and to compete with other states around us. And, and actually, I just returned from a trip to Ireland where we looked at and, and visited their biopharmaceutical sector there. It's a sector that we have presence here in Delaware, and I'd like to be able to compete with them and other countries around the world. And as it turns out, the thing that really makes the difference is the quality of the workforce and the training. And, and in, in Ireland, they have a better integration between higher education and the schools and training and the private companies uh, than we do here in the state. So we had a lot to learn from that and hopefully we'll be more competitive. We have invested significantly in federal research grants at the University of Delaware Star Campus for biopharmaceutical uh, bio uh, manufacturing and will continue to do so to create jobs of the future. So I guess the public education is one of the really big part of the budget. Um, so, uh, and I actually checked the 2014 numbers. So, and in terms of the percentage of the total budget, um, how we are doing, uh, and I believe uh, the percentage did increase a lot, like what you, uh, how much actually we are, um, uh highlighting uh the education and why it needs we need to actually have we need to spend more uh i can see that in percentages it used to be around like 24 percent uh when you got it it's well uh, over 30 percent now you know it depends right a little bit how you how you count it the, the 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 priorities for us i mentioned the teacher salaries you know you're only as good as the quality of your educators in the classrooms of course a good school uh, leadership principals and, and superintendents and board members is, is obviously important as well. But also uh, the support, we've really ramped up uh, financial support for schools with low-income children and English learners, a big priority to make sure that those students are ready to participate fully in the workforce. And if they, because if they don't, then there's, there's going to be other costs on the government for um, what what's not happening there with themselves and and in their families and and the communities in, in which uh, those schools are located. So we've prioritized that, but it really comes down to the educators in the classroom and and paying them uh, uh, an amount of money that that is competitive in our region. And so that's what we've tried to do. But you know, it's not just about money. We have to get performance, and that's been a focus of ours, particularly with uh, the school districts in the city of Wilmington, which are not performing at the level they need to be. It has to be a big priority. I mentioned our competition mm -hmm. in the biopharmaceutical uh, sector, and we need highly trained, highly educated uh, workforce to do that. So um, I guess, uh, you know, having kids in school these days, um, in public schools is a challenge. And for you to, uh, actually um, put that much emphasis on the education and increase uh, teacher salaries and uh, and doing other investments. It's extremely important, but uh, the challenge with these types of things, unfortunately, we won't see the results right away. And That's exactly, you're exactly right, Kamal. It's not going to be a benefit to uh, my administration. And really, that's not when it's all about. I've always uh, subscribed to uh, the Bill Clinton a philosophy which is elections and our service is more about the people, not the politician. It's more about the future uh, than it is the present and the past, certainly. And that's really how you need to lead, you know, is to to be doing things that are looking to the future, that are pre preparing, in this case, Delaware for the future and the economy of the future, making sure that our young people are prepared to be competitive. And by the way, Companies won't lo lo locate here if they don't if they think they don't. There's not a workforce that can do the highly STEM, science, technology, engineering, math related jobs that they have. I mean, that's the future, uh, and we have to prepare our young people for that future if we're going to be successful as a state. And so, it's always about what are you doing today to prepare uh, for the future. So that's actually really so important that like not everyone maybe is thinking about these things, but of course, as the governor, so you you probably are now the expert. Unfortunately, your term is up. So I actually never understood that. So I think you should 
uh, be allowed to do more than two turns. I mean, <laughs> well, so, I, would, I, I do. I would say um, to that, you know, um, it takes a lot of energy to do this job. And I think uh, and you kind of you, you get worn down by it, frankly, particularly if you have a three or two or three year pandemic right in the middle of it where the stress levels are high and a lot of the res decision making responsibility fell on my shoulders and my desk. I had a great team. I had a great team, fabulous team. But, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, uh, d difficult decisions had to be made at my desk. And so that wears you down. But I I'm, I've thought about what, what to do next. And I, I just am looking for still additional. I still have some juice left looking for challenges and, and really to focus on some of the things that I care most about education and education of our city think, children. You know, that, that's definitely like education is, especially for the state of Delaware, I always said, I consider myself one of those who actually, if I was born here, that wouldn't be my choice because I wasn't born here and stayed in Delaware. So I'm a better Delawarean than those who were born here. So well, uh, you'll be interesting to know. It's an interesting a phenomenon, I think. I went just the other day, uh, this week, earlier this week, to uh, the Department of Education, Secretary of Education Scholars uh, Celebration Awards Night. And so we had 93 high ch achieving students from public high schools across our state, mostly seniors in high schools. And I think and uh, these kids were unbelievable. And I can tell you that half of them at least were from immigrant families like your own, where their parents were very focused on making sure their children really apply themselves in school of, of an extra focus i think on stem education and just some incredible uh, young people that we celebrated the other night with their teachers and their parents and the schools in which they've uh done so well and and that's where the future is i mean those are that's those uh, those students are going to be the leaders in in our state uh in years to come Definitely. And because, uh, you know, the way that I see um, with our workforce, uh, the um, other things that we do in this uh, community, not just here, but anywhere else, like uh, the crime rate related to that, um, you know, development and all the other things, they're all coming down to the education at the end of the day. And unless we have we are um, ahead of the game, uh, it's not going to happen. But I think most of the work that you have done will probably see the result of those in the next eight to 10 years uh, period where we are going to probably go back and say, well, this is the uh, outcome of all those investments from 2000, uh, 2016 to 2024. And just from looking at the percentage of the total of the budget, it just shows that we are definitely going to see some uh, positive improvements um, and hopefully then we'll have you again on the YouTube and then we'll talk about it 10 years from now. Now, uh, economy is another really important part. And I know you have uh, a lot of things in your budget that's going to hopefully help the economy. Now, it's a challenging time, uh, even for businesses, even for countries, uh, even more like not just for the states, but like the, our country here, but uh, the state, of course. Other countries, I see this as a big problem. Inflation is almost becoming uh, like something that we have to deal uh, day to day, which we are, we are not used to. Um, can we just talk about the economy a little bit to see what you have in the budget uh, for 2025? Yeah, so uh, creating an environment where businesses can be successful and create jobs. I mean, creating jobs has got to be number one priority, both from the perspective of providing uh, young people and providing families with the kind of income they need to raise a family, to buy a home, to save for re college and retirement. And so we have to be competitive with states around us and even with countries around the world. I mentioned the trip to Ireland, the competition that our companies have with them as well. And so that means really uh, we have created what we call the Delaware Prosperity Partnership which is truly a public-private partnership. The board is consists mostly of private sector business leaders and, and academics and the like, as well as legislators and myself and Rob Ward are the co-chairs. And they've been very successful in working with companies to create more jobs. We've created or worked with companies to 
to add uh, over 30,000 new jobs since 2017. And that mm. considers the fact that you had a global pandemic right in the middle of that. We've had some big successes in terms of companies that have decided to move to Delaware. And we've had some, you know, it's, it's you know, we're not going to see a, a lot of companies moving 1,000, 2,000 jobs here. But, you know, 50 jobs here, 100 jobs there, smaller scale manufacturing, we've had some successes, I think, is the way it's going to go. So that means you got to keep on it. We are making those investments at the University of Delaware in the biopharmaceutical sector. Those will pay dividends in the future. We have money set aside for what we call a graduation lab space. This is lab space for uh, small companies that are incubating at the, at the Star Campus or, or at the experimental station. They want to grow, hire more employees. And so we've got a fund to help them find locations where they have lab space for these folks. We've invested, along with the, the new DuPont company, in facilities at the experimental station, which are now not just private sector, uh, not just DuPont uh, facilities where we incubate uh, science-based uh, and technology-based companies. So we, we're developing and cultivating that ecosystem of science and tech and, far, and the pharmaceutical sector, which we think can be strong uh, here in Delaware. And just really thinking about it, not, not just putting all our eggs in one basket, try to hit a home run, but knocking out some singles and some doubles and getting uh, companies across our state. Uh, we've got some redevelopment. We've made funds. We've, we've learned that when you have companies looking at your state, you have to have sites that, they're, that can be ready quickly so that they can move into them. So we've made some public investments in industrial parks and in small business parks uh, up and down the state so that we have those sites ready to go when we have a prospect that's ready to make a decision to move to Delaware. So lots of different pieces that, that Kurt uh, uh, and his team at the, at the Prosperity Partnership have done a, an excellent job. And one of the best things that we did uh, seven years ago was to form that Delaware Prosperity Partnership. And they've, the results speak for themselves. Now, the, uh, Rob Buccino was with us. I don't know if you had a chance to see it. Um, uh, he talked about his uh, Buccini Group's um, investments in the city of Wilmington, and we discussed a couple of their projects and uh, making this city more attractive uh, for those who may want to live here, not just from like from one neighborhood to the other, but uh, us being very close to other uh, states. So it's kind of like the hub uh, in this uh, mid-Atlantic region. So... Uh, and I see the, a lot of efforts from their side. Of course, they're a uh, private business, you know, uh, but also I see uh, taking um, initiatives, uh, different, I see a different vision there where they are actually making certain things better uh, for Delaware. Uh, and those are always good, uh, good to see. And as you know, our, one of our medical practices is going to be, is already in downtown Wilmington now. And I was telling him that, we feel now safer in downtown than 10 years ago, where I wouldn't probably open an office in downtown Wilmington uh, in 2014. So, but today we don't have that problem. I, I don't know if you have seen the new office yet, but uh, we would love to have you there. Uh, we just finished uh, all the renovations and it's it feels different. And I think uh, there's a good future. Um, and if it feels that way for us, I'm thinking that it would be for those other employers that you uh, you were talking about who may want to, uh, of course, when they come here and then do investments, they also look at the uh, being able to hire people, if people want to live here, and all those things all together, they're tied into it, like, just like the even the uh, ranking on our education, um, everything is all together. It's a difference. Right. And it makes a huge difference. Now, speaking of... Well, if I could just make one point there, uh, and that is this. I've always believed, and I think it's it's true, that uh, if Delaware is going to be successful, the state of Delaware is going to be successful, then the city of Wilmington has to be su su successful as the as the uh, the business hub of the state, uh, as well as the kind of the corporate capital, which provides so much revenue. And if the city is going to be successful... Every neighborhood, every street has to be 
successful. You mentioned crime. And so crime and safety, public safety gets to be a big priority. And we've worked with the city and Mayor Przicki to try to address that and have, and, and crime rates are down in our state. But the investment, the private investments that the Uchini Pollen and other companies have brought to downtown Wilmington and into the neighborhood neighborhoods with their participation in the housing pro programs has been transformative. I mean, they must have a billion dollars worth of private investment in new residential properties uh, downtown and around the downtown mm -hmm. and in the buildings that they've taken over uh, with new, um, uh, new employees. What that does is it brings people to live here to create uh, a greater you know, safety in the streets, more activity, which creates uh, safety. They bring with it uh, tax revenue that helps play for pay for police officers and firefighters and community development. And it just keeps building and we need that private investment. We do have uh, at statewide, uh, the downtown uh, development district project, which has invested in William Wilmington's downtown. It's invested in the downtown in Dover, uh, in, uh, in Seaford and other towns up and down our state. And uh, and here in, in Wilmington, and the idea is to bring more critical mass, more people living downtown, which helps the rest of the city. You know, I've lived a mile from downtown uh, at, on 19th Street for almost 40 years now, and I've seen the downtown district and the city generally go through ups and downs. I think we're kind of on an upward trajectory now, and a lot of that is because of the private investment and the public investments that we've made significant investment in housing in our communities, particularly on the east side. The land bank, I've been, uh, been touring some of the uh, neighborhoods that they've been working on, doing a tremendous job in eliminating vacant properties and, and bringing vitality back to neighborhoods. And so we got to keep working on that and make our city stronger. And uh, you know, I'm not going to give your address, obviously, but you live in the city, right? Yeah, I live on 19th Street. People, most people know where I live. <laughs> well, I just, uh, Warner that. School. Well, that, that those. Uh, I mean, I know where you are, but I don't uh, like. I think that helps. Like, if and it, it's been for a long time you've been there. So about 40 uh, years. Yeah. I, <laughs> so it kind of shows, uh, like, uh, you know, if the governor lives there, then people know that this is uh, this is the place to be and. Uh, the only thing that I was a little bit um, disappointed, not with us, but I think with the decision on the other side, it it was Elon Musk um, when they when he moved the um, the headquarters from here to Texas, I believe, right? Yeah, so that that was something. Actually, I think uh, you know he uh, made some comments that were critical of Delaware. I think it was really just the fact that he didn't get what he wanted. And actually, I think that uh, in some ways benefits uh, the perception of corporations to uh, Delaware. You know, most corporations, large corporations are incorporated here. Uh, mm -hmm. they, that accounts for about 30, 35 percent of our state budget. Without that, we'd have a sales tax, no, no question, or higher taxes somewhere else. And so it's very important. I appoint judges who have experience in corporate law. And, and uh, so they're ready to go and when they have difficult cases to litigate. Uh, they're able to get litigants in and out of uh, court quickly. So that limits the amount of money that they have to put up for, for lawyers and for the litigation. So actually, I think that, you know, it depends obviously on who you talk to, but we haven't seen yet a negative impact on that on our incorporation business, because most people want to be incorporated in Delaware because of the expertise in our bo corporate bar, uh, in our chancery court and those judges and in the processes, they don't have jury trials there. They have expert judges that oversee those cases. Uh, one guy like uh, Elon Musk, who wa always wants to get his way, doesn't get his way. And, you know, he's going to say some things that maybe are critical. Some people might see that as a part. It was politically driven, probably. Like uh, I think he's uh, not a fan of uh, President Biden, at least from what I've seen so far. It, it may be like he took an advantage of that decision and just used that as an opportunity to move to Texas. But um, well, as I travel around the country, and I have particularly when I was in the Congress, 
talking to lawyers, say, in California, and they would always tell me that uh, they would never incorporate uh, one of their businesses in California that they'd always incorporate here in Delaware for lots of very good technical reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Governor Carney, we're going to go into healthcare. Uh, I know um, uh, most people may know this or not, but uh, one third of your budget is uh, healthcare related uh, expenses, expenditures. And, uh, and because we are a healthcare provider, I always feel like I can help you there. But of course we are kind of limited with what we can do just want to kind of get the uh, budget overview on healthcare, and then I have a couple follow-up questions. Yeah, so one of the things that we've done with state government, right, is we've created what we call a spending benchmark. And the benchmark is really to help us guide spending from a year-to-year -year basis, particularly to keep it under control when we have excessive revenue. And the legislature, they... First of all, they did not approve a constitutional amendment that I had proposed to change the way we do our budgeting, but they have followed along with our benchmark and trying to tie uh, spending growth to uh, these objective measures. One of the things that we've uh, attempted to do is to create a similar kind of benchmark uh, for healthcare and hospitals in particular in our state. Mm -hmm. And, be, you know, the Affordable Care Act, one of the things that it was supposed to do was to create more consumer-driven health care utilization, meaning uh, consumers having some skin in the game when they made those decisions. Now, it's a little bit tricky or a lot tricky because, you know, as a you know ordinary citizen like that, I, I don't really have the expertise to make, make those decisions. So a lot of insurance plans, most have move towards benefit packages that require some uh, medical professional, primary care physician to make those recommendations up front about what test is, times the tests are needed and so on, as opposed to just uh, an ordinary citizen trying to decide what they want to do. As it turns out, you know, in states that do that and companies that do that, most private sector companies do it. Uh, it's a more efficient way, i.e. less expensive way. It's a very, it, it, there's no doubt that healthcare is an expensive proposition. What we need to do is to kind of allow the cost to grow at the growth or the rate of economic growth, say GDP plus one or 2%. That would be kind of the benchmark. Um, the problem with that, of course, is the costs are greater healthcare cost inflation is is higher than the rest of the economy. And so you need to that extra. But the, the, if you keep doing it that, if you have a, a payer like taxpayers that pay for Medicaid, state employees, retirees, and uh, Medicare, um, then they're going to be called on to pay more as that pie, that healthcare pie grows. And so Promoting more better prevention, greater util, uh, more effective utilization of healthcare is what we need to do. Very hard to do it, and very hard to do it in state government because the benefit packages, healthcare benefit packages, are very rich and allow a lot of uh, a lot of flexibility in in terms of who decides what procedure you know a, a, a patient might get or not. Uh, it's very complicated, but if we don't get our arms around it, we're not going to be able to pay our retirees much in their paycheck. We're not going to be able to pay our teachers uh, uh, what we need to pay them and, and other public employees, the state troopers and the like. And so it's a big challenge, and it's a challenge that faces every state and the federal government as uh, the largest uh, funder for uh, Medicare and senior services. Right. I think like um, from the state, uh, state of Delaware standpoint, for those who are actually following us, so uh, your health care expenditure in the budget has two different uh, big uh, portions. One is the Medicaid part of it. The other right. part is you being the um, biggest employer of the state, your self-funded health insurance. Right, uh, which includes, most people don't, realize it includes the school districts mm -hmm. uh, and it includes 
the university, Delaware State University, Delaware Tech. Uh, the university is, you know, you've maybe seen in the in the in the news that they've got a big increase in their, along with us, you know, with their healthcare expenditure. So they're looking at maybe whether they can do it uh, less expensively on their own. I doubt that, but uh, that's their prerogative. But yeah, because those costs, you know, it drives up tuition at the University of Delaware. It drives up uh, and crowds out other spending uh, in state agencies. And so it's a big issue for all of us. So, uh, Governor Carter, you mentioned the uh, speed, uh, the spending uh, benchmark uh, and how we can actually, how we are able to implement that uh, in the healthcare. Um, is that already fully in place? Are we doing that? Like what Maryland? It's fully, it's fully in place in state government benchmark. There is no benchmark currently in healthcare. There's a proposal a legislation in the General Assembly that would do it a little bit differently than we proposed. Uh, and that has not passed either. There's a lot of very active discussion going on right now around that, that question. 350? Yes. Okay. That's a different approach. That's an approach uh, that's utilized in the state of Vermont. And it's a tighter control uh, than the benchmark that, that we were ta had been talking about and the benchmark that we use for state government. Um, and so there's a lot of really uh, important conversation going on right now about what's the best way to do that without compromising quality. It turns out that we spend a lot more money per person uh, than other states, and yet our quality is not uh, up there with the, at the same level as the spending. And so we have that similar problem with, you know, school performance, and that's a that bothers me. And so we should work on both of those uh, to get uh, more bang for our buck. So, uh, you know, on the healthcare side, uh, the I think when you and I we discussed this, I believe last year uh, on one of our uh, private meetings, the I think the Maryland model, I believe, is the one that we were trying to follow. Now, yeah, we we looked at that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Uh, come on, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so we looked at that as well, and that's an option. They basically, those hospitals basically get a global budget from uh, a state, you know, sophisticated state board. And so there's one hospital in our system, it used to be called Nanakook. It's now, now Tidal Health, which was purchased by the hospital in Salisbury. Mm -hmm. So they're subject to that Maryland global budget. Now, that's one way to do it. Um it's not the way that we've chosen. It actually is um, in some ways more intrusive. You know, we've heard this, these arguments about government control, which is, uh, you know, you, when you talk about government control, Medicare is the biggest healthcare program in the, in the country. But in any case, um, we don't have a proposal like that on the table. Is it one that we could uh, consider sure, but I think it's certainly if the objections now are as they are, and there have been strong objections to uh, 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 350, uh, they would really object to uh, that global budget. Now there is a different approach mm -hmm. which enables hospital systems, and we've had these conversations with the Moore's Children's Hospital to have a global budget and basically accept. Uh, some of the risk associated with that so that they could invest in uh, prevention, early prevention and other things that would save money down the uh, the road. A little bit hard to understand how a children's hospital would work uh, that way because they don't have the adults, which is where the savings would come from. Um, I'm not an expert in it, but I know there's interest there. And that's maybe where a global budget budget could could work where we give a budget and say, okay, here's your budget and manage within it. If you go over it, that's on you. If you go under it, then that, you know, you get to keep uh, some of that extra for other investments. Remember, our hospital, none of our hospitals are for-profit hospitals. They're nonprofit hospitals. They have a healthcare mandate. Uh, and so all the extra revenue, meaning charges over costs, which goes into their fund balance really have to, has to go to keeping them viable financially, as well as you know making investments in uh, programs that will keep Delawareans uh, healthier. 
you know, although they're not for profit, um, uh, they're nonprofits organization, but they make a lot of profits. So, well, they uh, have they have surplus yeah. revenue or you know balances for balances that that accrue to what's called their fund balance. And yeah, yeah some of them have very large fund balances, which means their charges are greater than their expenses. And others are have a very tight margin in terms of revenue and expenses. And it's very different between a Christiana Care, say, and a Tidal Health or a Bay Health. Or St. Um, Francis. Oh, St. Francis is, struggles the most. Right. So I think uh, the one that I was probably referring to is systems like Christiana and Bay Health. Now, the problem is, um, you know, there are two, a couple issues there. One is... Uh, because they are nonprofits, um, but they are they have higher charges, higher uh, income for same similar services. They are also able to pay for certain services better, like with the doctors, with the staff, with all that. So then it puts us almost uh, right away in a disadvantage. Those groups like mine, who is doing this a lot less expensive, but now we are actually even struggling to compete with what the environment that they are creating. So because they're able to spend the money um, without any, um, you know, responsibility in many ways, and yet they are still making profit. Now, um, not to mention the hospital name, but those who are watching, they can watch the other episodes and then they will know that which hospital I'm talking about. But they hired, like, surgeons from us. Like, they just, uh, like, we have an agreement for... Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they well, just they just bought the, a surgeon with a higher salary, and they're the, well, they're the biggest player, so they have the biggest market share, and so they have they have power within the marketplace. Um, they also have as as a, a healthcare organ nonprofit healthcare organization, they have an obligation, uh, and they you know they try to fill that obligation, but they also um, you know try to maximize uh, their market share, and that gives them power well, in the marketplace. Uh, I think, John, one of the biggest uh, maybe help that we can have is the transparency. So since they are nonprofits, so like if people are educated to make these, like use these tools, like patients, they can actually see exactly what uh, this goes here versus there's some public tools, but yeah, there, the Affordable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act was supposed to have incentivized just what you're talking about, which is consumer driven decisions. And I remember several years ago when I had my hip replaced, talking to uh, the finance guy at uh, Christiana Care at the time and asking him, like, theoretically, what the price would be, what price would I have to pay? if I was paying myself at Christiana Care for a uh, hip replacement. Mm -hmm. And his answer was a little bit hard to understand at first, which was, well, we don't really have prices per se. Mm -hmm. We have charges. And most of those charges are plus or minus a Medicare rate. And so even in the bill that you mentioned earlier, there is a reference to reference pricing, meaning, and I think the provision said that you couldn't have more than 250% above the Medicare price for a procedural, 250%. That's a big difference. You know, on a $10,000 procedure, that's $25,000 you could, you know, which would be in that limit if my math is right. And um, so it's it's uh, probably too come like we don't have that. The, the bottom line is we don't have many people shopping around for where can they get Particularly, and mostly in, in terms of state employees and retirees, they don't have any. They don't have to pay much of the of the rate, so it doesn't matter to them. They want to get the best procedure, and they should. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, but that that idea of consumer driven, price driven utilization really hasn't uh, taken effect, certainly here in Delaware. And one other thing that I want to mention this, and then maybe we can uh, discuss these in follow up meetings, but. One of the issues that I see is, uh, in some cases, I feel like maybe we are not focusing on the insurance companies and the third party administrators as much as we do focus on the facilities in some cases, because 
they are also setting up the cost, uh, the charges, like because they are benefiting from that as well. So it's not just the facility who's benefiting from high charges, but because of the 85% and 15% administration uh, portion of their total you know, uh, expenses, they are um, willing to pay more to increase their 15% pie. Yeah, yeah, you bring up a, a very important uh, but complicated uh, player in the middle, so to speak. And this this idea of, of uh, you know, pr proprietary issues and, and costs and and uh, and the information that they have and lack of transparency is a little disturbing. I, I don't, uh, this is an area that I don't know a lot about other than we are paying those intermediaries significant amounts of money to manage uh, the system, if you will, and without a lot of transparency. And I'm not sure that I, I have the answer to that other than I've always believed when, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, and I was in the Congress just after that, that uh, moving towards, you know, some consumer-driven decision-making, or at least more kind of managed care decision-making where you kind of had, you know, experts, people making those decisions about what kind of procedure you need or not uh, would be helpful in the long run. We're not there, and we're certainly not there uh, in state government, mostly because with the arrangements that we've had, the state covers and pays for most of those most of those costs. What I do know is it's a third of our budget to to get back to that uh, observation that you made over two billion dollars between Medicaid, which is only half of the Medicaid spend. The other half is basically federal. We don't we only have gap funding in terms of Medicare. So Medicare covers most of that for our seniors. Right. And then we cover, you know, what's not covered for state employees and the retirees and, uh, and then active duty uh, state employees, most of whom do have a managed care arrangement, uh, unlike uh, the retirees who, who don't have that. This is going to be uh, this is not is an issue that's not going to go away. It's a big uh, uh, financial issue, both at every level of government and in and in the business sector. We used to hear more from businesses about healthcare cost effects on their bottom line, um, and um, you know I'm sure we'll we'll continue to hear more in the future. But they're certainly related to all of the operations of public and private. Uh, agencies and companies you know uh, i have i have to say this i'm actually pleased to uh, kind of see where we are overall like we have a lot of these challenges uh, but when you look at the progress and in your two terms uh, i think you know from the objective side of me i can say that Delaware is a better place um, so that's really important so i think that's the message we want people out there to hear and because we want people to stay in Delaware. We want people to invest in Delaware. Uh, and that's, you know, one of them is I'm the example of this. I, like I live, I was, uh, I was born and raised in Turkey, lived in a, lived in a big city and, you know, being in Newark initially and then just now in Wilmington for the last 15, 16 years. Um, it was a challenge, but I want to, to see how things are going to be. Yes, it took a little bit, maybe longer, but we are here now, and this is a better place than it was before. And I do want to thank you for all those uh, services that you have done. Uh, just so, like one, if I don't ask this, I would kind of feel guilty. From the environment uh, standpoint, um, I know we had in our last discussion in the YouTube, um, we discussed uh, the climate uh, change and the crisis around it, some of whom, I think you and I, we were kind of on the same page. It's just man-made, like we have seen it in Dubai. Uh, like, have you seen those videos? What's happening in, uh, like when they play with the uh, mother nature. Um, but still we have to be kind of like, kind of uh, careful. Uh, Anything uh, important in the yeah, budget? Yeah, uh, you know, we've we have moved the tried to move the needle on uh, climate change and uh, response to climate change. First of all, you have to uh, 
uh, you have to, the starting point is accepting the science out there that global warming is happening, that sea rise is happening, and that'll have negative effects on climate. It'll have negative effects on coastal communities. And we're already seeing it in Delaware. So the, the first part is, you know, in the my role with, with uh, the public is to convince people that uh, it is real. And so they'll be willing to accept it and make adjustments to uh, life and living uh, to try to to uh, address it and, and, and stop it in some way. And that means reducing carbon emissions into the atmosphere. There are two big uh, places that carbon emissions come from, transportation, uh, cars, trucks, and vans, uh, and other things related to, uh, to that. Uh, and then electricity generation. Those are the pay two biggies. Uh, we've made some progress on electricity generation just by converting, when I say we, the state of Delaware, by converting coal-fired generation uh, to natural gas. Natural gas is not carbon-free. There's yeah. less carbon in it than, uh, than coal-fired generation. And so that's been, a, we've been able to meet our percent, our targets, uh, uh, with that transition. But now it's a harder transition to go to more renewables, offshore wind, other, I think we're going to have to look at small scale nuclear. We all already have a big, large scale nuclear plant across the river and provides quite a bit of electricity. And then the second source is transportation and mm -hmm. the movement to electric vehicles. And that hasn't moved as quickly as electricity generation. Uh, and we have just recently agreed to join a collaboration of states uh, that will benefit from the in, in, the industry's transition from gas-powered vehicles to electric-powered power, vehicles. By the way, if you don't convert your electricity-generating system to non-carbon-based system, uh, powering your cars with carbon-based electricity doesn't help a whole lot. And so that has to happen together. And uh, it will be uh, a, an ongoing, it's really something about the future. I feel like we've set the table in this administration for both in terms of uh, our renewable portfolio standard on the electricity generation side, and the targets there. Uh, and then on the electric vehicle sides, the uh, legislation, uh, that passed our commitment with offshore wind. And uh, and we have some bills that'll be in the General Assembly. So we're setting the table and that to be followed through with the next uh, administration and then, and governors uh, to come over the next, you know, number of years. So, um, Governor Carney, I, again, uh, I wanna thank you for uh, joining us. Um, uh, you, you have done a great job. Um, I don't know if it's my place to say this, but I guess as someone who lives here for so long, I should be able to write. So thank you for doing what you have done. Uh, and I know you are going to be there for other services. Uh, you're not going anywhere. So um, uh, I know you'll be still contributing to the uh, state of Delaware um, in different capacities. But what you have done in the last eight years was uh, amazing. Um, and it's important. It's important for someone uh, who's in politics to be able to do that without getting into any uh, any of the scandals, any of the um, you know other types of rumors where you did it so clean. From uh, like th this is not just the last eight years. Of course, it's been a longer time than that in politics. Being able to do that is amazing. And thank you for being um, uh, who you are and doing what you have done for the state of Delaware. Well, thank you for uh, for that, and thank you for uh, what your group does to provide healthcare services in our state. Um, I was I would be remiss if not to acknowledge them in particular for their role during the pandemic. Uh, every healthcare worker came up big. The state of Delaware came up big. And, you know, one of the things I learned when I was uh, serving in the Congress is that Delaware is a special place. You know, I was a single Congress person for the whole state of Delaware, 900,000 employees, uh, employees, 900,000 constituents, um, other districts much smaller, but we're, we are closer 
as elected officials to the people that we represent than in most places. And I'm pretty sure that I couldn't do uh, what we've done in terms of service and focus uh, without the relationship that we're able to develop with the people of Delaware. And so I thank them for that opportunity. Hopefully the things that we've done will really set the table for future success. That was what the way we stayed focused. There's a management guru by the name of Stephen Covey who says, uh, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we've tried to do that, several main things, not least of which is creating an economy or cultivating an economy that creates jobs for the people of our, our business and of our state and uh, and focusing on keeping our financial house in, in order so we can do the things that we knew, making investments today that will pay dividends uh, in the future. So it's, you know, we're we're lucky too in that after the, we weren't so lucky with COVID, but after COVID, you know, the economy really accelerated out of that. And we had uh, revenue to make investments that we otherwise wouldn't have had. And that, that was a good thing. Okay. So thank you. Thank you again. And we'll see you soon with uh, other events. Uh, I know we are planning to bring you back in the next couple of months, uh, but uh, until then stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Kamal. Um, right. <clears throat> so we are uh, done with our uh, Governor Carney event. Um, he's an amazing guy. Uh, I believe uh, we'll see him in different capacities. We don't want to go into some of the details for his future plans. I I know. Uh, uh, some of the things that he's planning to do, and I'm glad that he is. Um, so how did you find the conversation? Well, I thought it was uh, uh, very insightful. Um, having that discussion with him as a follow-up to our other session, which I believe was February of last year. Mm -hmm. um, also touching on the state of state address that he had in last year compared to this year. Um, and some of the research preparation we did looking for it, just seeing some of these numbers and the increases is kind mm -hmm. of like, puts a lot of things into perspective. Uh, I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that for such a small state, only, you know, population of around a million, the amount of money and, you know, resources that are allocated for certain projects is just of course. Uh, really puts a lot of things in perspective and having to manage all that, let alone successfully, and, you know, putting it to, to work and, and getting the funds in the right spots they need to be is obviously a challenge. So uh, being able to do that year over year uh, and effectively help the citizen at the same time is obviously important. There's still some work to do, especially on the healthcare side. So uh, the physician shortage uh, is one of the big challenges for not just for us, but for the rest of the uh, country. Um, and also like this benchmarking issue on the spendings, it's really important. Mm -hmm. So, but I know we work with uh, some of the state officials uh, in the leadership of uh, Brian Townsend, and then we'll continue working on those uh, because we want to make sure that, you know, we are able to give them uh, good data from the actual real business side of healthcare. Right. Uh, and this is why it's important for us to have these conversations uh, with our state officials because um, now they, all, they hear what we are going through, what mm -hmm. we are thinking, and uh, then we can help them yeah. make some of those decisions. One of the really humbling things that I hear from Governor Carney was uh, a couple of times he said he's not the expert. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to outpatient practices, we are the expert. And as someone maybe on the hospital side, right. and some, someone maybe on the different fields. So bringing these uh, uh, expertise into the uh, equation is kind of the way to go so that we can mm -hmm. actually make more meaningful impact on the policies and procedures that we have in place. So uh, I enjoyed the conversation. I um, uh, I always supported him, although I should say I always supported him when he was going against Jack Markel, I was on the other camp. But uh, out of that, there's something good came out. So he was the congressman for a couple terms. Yeah. Great guy um, and great Delawarean and uh, happy to know him and we'll see him in the future. Now, we next week, we have our events confirmed yet? 
Uh, so next week, yeah, it's supposed to be speaker Valerie Longhurst mm -hmm. um, joining us. And then in the following beginning of May, following month, um, we have some candidates running for the Newcastle County executive position. So mm -hmm. we'll be able to hear from at least two uh, candidates who are running for that position, hear their thoughts, plans uh, for their campaign. And we are also working on uh, Chris Coons and Tom Parker. Okay. Uh, so uh, sometime in the summer, probably we'll bring them. Uh, well, uh, this was a great uh, session. Uh, thank you for listening and thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon. Right, thank you. Bye-bye.